I'm Brian. On this podcast, I'll talk about law enforcement, social media platforms, and just life. So you guys saw the name of this podcast, this certain episode. It's called Who Am I? That's how I started it out, the title there. And it's not something philosophical. I mean, I'm not just going off the deep end on you. It, uh, I just figured we needed a break from all the normal crap that is going on right now in the world. So something you're actually supposed to do within the first, usually they say five episodes of anything, is you're supposed to give a rundown of who you are. Now, I know many of you already know a lot of my history because you've been following me on Smoky CNC Woodworks for a good while. And some of you may have been following me on Smoky Uncuffed before it was all podcast style. So for those that haven't seen those and really don't know who I am, I'm just going to go from point A to now just to give you an idea who I am, where I come from. So I'm from the little town of Lindsay, Oklahoma. That's a town that's roughly an hour south of Oklahoma City, probably. About 30 minutes southwest of Norman, Oklahoma, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with. It was an oil field town, still is. And I grew up there my entire life, same house, uh, 1 through 18 years old. Both of my parents were school teachers. Uh, growing up, I, you know, I did whatever normal kid does. I... Back then, what was normal is I could jump on my bicycle, take off up what we called Murray Hill, which is where I lived at the base of, and go visit friends. And I could take off 10 in the morning, and the rule was I had to be home by the time streetlights came on. That was then. Now, there is no way I'd let a kid to do that. And most people don't. They don't let their kids just run wild all over town. I mean, because by the time I got a little bit older, you know, 13, 14, I was allowed to go all over town. It's not a big town. It's about mm, 2,500, 3,000 people. Maybe a little bit bigger now since, I, I mean, since I've moved out, I know Oldfield's had a big boom and a lot of people have moved in. But back then, I mean, it was just a small town and you could run all over the place. So I played a lot of sports. Uh, growing up, I played baseball from like the age of four till uh, 16, so 15, 16. Didn't play it in high school. Uh, played football for uh, two or three years. I mean, seventh grade through about ninth or tenth. Just wasn't my deal. I mean, because I was tall and lanky. So I played basketball. I and mean, that's where I devoted all my time was basketball. Now, I mean, I was all right, but I wasn't anything that to scream about. I wasn't going to get a scholarship anywhere. But I loved playing and I had fun doing it. So I did that. Ran just a touch of track, not very long. And oddly enough, in an oil field town, I played tennis for a little bit. Never got just super great at it either, but it was enjoyable and it was what was going on while baseball was going on in high school, which I was done with by the time I was in high school, simply because I'd already been playing for, you know, 10, 11 years since I was four years old and I was just tired of it. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, back then, by the time I got to high school, the thing to do was to go drag main. You'd jump in your car with a buddy or two, you'd drive up and down and ours was down to Sonic at the south end of Main Street and turn around and go back to Love's or close to it, which was a big L. It was probably about a mile long. And just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for hours. Now I look at that and think, how on earth was that any fun? So growing up, whenever I was uh, getting a little bit older, I had an older brother that's five years older than me. And straight out of high school, he became a medic, an EMT. And he did that at Lindsay, the little town, for a little while. He then, whenever he went to college, he went over to Valley View Hospital, which is now a Mercy Hospital in Ada, and was a medic there, and still is today. I mean, he's been doing this for, oh man, 30-something years. He, he loves it. So during high school, my job, my biggest job from about 16 until I was about 19, I think that last year I was out of high school, I was a lifeguard at our local public swimming pool, which was an Olympic-sized pool. And I did that that last year when I was 19. I uh, also went to EMT school simply because it's a decent job for college. They would allow you to work your shifts, and when you had classes, you could be dropped off at the college, get your class over with, they'd come pick you up, and you just went on with your shift. So back to high school for a minute. So 
got through high school. That's where I worked at during the summers. Uh, I didn't, I, well, I graduated, but I mean, I was by no means top of the class. I was kind of a middle runger. I never, I never just got into school great. I just didn't enjoy it. And the biggest problem I had was I would never study. And I mean, I was a B student all the way through it. So skipping forward from that, I uh, then went to college at East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma, which ECU, so of course we call it Easy Credit University. So I went to school there and I had goals on being an architect. They had a architecture program. I started it and I'd had a minor of computer science because at the time, AutoCAD had gotten real big and everything was real computer related in the architecture field. So I went into it, I got two years into it, and God, I, just, I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't declare my major, but I never thought, saw this coming. So I got two years into it and they come forward and say, yeah, we're dropping the architecture program. There's just not enough interest in it. I was shocked. I mean, I'm stuck. What am I going to do now? I've got two years into this. You mean I want to spend two more years getting doing something else? So I went and looked at transferring. I went to OSU, Oklahoma State Cowboys, and because uh, they've got like the third highest accredited architecture school in the nation. Went up and looked at it. And bear in mind, all through this college, I'm working as a medic full-time at the hospital there in Ada. So I went up there thinking, well, I'll just go to the local EMS and see if I can get on with them because our license carries. And I went and toured the campus. I mean, it's beautiful. But I got in there to talk to the guy that was giving me the tour. And I said, what about your EMS? This is what I want to do. I want to go to work for him. And he said, no, you don't have a job here on our architecture program. You sleep in this bunk thing that you don't have a dorm you have beds underneath the visitors stand the visitors bleachers at the football field and it's a huge drafting department so you have beds in there and so they said we expect you to spend about 80 hours a week on projects and i said well that won't work uh how am i supposed to eat i've got to be able to supply some food somehow so they wouldn't back down that's exactly exactly what they wanted done. They did not want you having a job. They wanted you devoting all your time to their program. So with a simple thank you, I loaded up my car and headed back to Ada America and went in the next day, changed my major to computer science because that was my minor. Now I had no goals of being a computer guy full time. I know I couldn't live in a cubicle which is ironic that I say that because that's exactly what I'm in right now, the little cubicle desk thing that I've got built out here. And so I changed to computer science and devoted my time to it. Really didn't have a minor at that point. And I clipped along with it. So on the medic side, I was doing that before I got hired at Ada. So I started in my hometown of Lindsay. So for that first two years, I went through basic and then I was an intermediate uh, medic at Lindsay Hospital. I drove home every weekend for two years and would go to work Saturday morning at 7 or 8 o'clock. I think it was 7 o'clock with shift change. At 7 in the morning, I would pull a 16-hour shift Saturday. I'd get up and do it again Sunday morning, pull a 16-hour shift. And after that shift, I'd drive back to Ada because I had to be at school Monday morning. So that's the way I got through with it through the first two years. I just worked every weekend for two years and went to school five days a week. So I then eventually got hired on after that second year at Valley View Hospital where my brother worked and became a medic there. there it was much easier on me because it was 24 on, 48 off. And like I said before, they would allow you to go to school during the shift. They would drop you off. So I did that for, oh, I did it for the rest of my college career which, by the way, ended up being five years since the little dropout of the architecture program. I mean, because honestly, there was one semester or two semesters that was just straight architecture. So it did me no good in any other thing I was doing. So I went ahead and went back. <clears throat> so all in all, I ended up working at Valley View, for, I think, for four years. And 
it was interesting. I mean, you got to see tons of stuff at that job. Many of the people you dealt with or many of the people law enforcement deal with, I mean, because a lot of that stuff, drugs, alcohol, fighting, car wrecks. I mean, police officers, law enforcement are always at these things. So I got to know many of the troopers while I was there. And there was one of them that was pushing me to join the Highway Patrol. His name was Pete Peterson. And God bless him, the man passed about two years ago, maybe three now. Uh, great guy. And they were trying to talk me into joining, he and his wife. Because, ironically, his wife was a trooper too. And I promise you, if anybody ever looks at this and thinks it's just a man field, I would have invited you to bow up to her <laughs> back then when I was in college. I watched her manhandle people. Wow. She was something. So we went on a call. We'd been on more than one of these calls. And this just one day, it just tripped my trigger. I was in the back of an ambulance caring for a guy with a knife wound in his back. And right in the middle of the transport to the hospital, the guy jumps up and decides we're going to fight. And I assured him we weren't, but he charged me. Well, I picked up an e-bottle, which if you don't know what an e-bottle is, it's an oxygen bottle. And I hit him with the butt of it, knocked him down. And to my amazement, he hopped right back up. As I said, he was high as a kite. And my driver was a paramedic up front. He is looking in the rearview mirror witnessing all this, and he screams, handrail. I jump up, grab a handrail, which is, runs the length of the box on the ambulance, and it's just so you can have stability when you're driving or riding down the road. I grab it. This guy comes running at me. He locks up the brakes. This guy flies the length of the cabin, hits the wall, knocks him out cold in a wedge. Fight was over. So we dealt with him, we got to the hospital, the doctor had to deal with him, and I think ended up sending him on, uh, called the police on him. And, so he got to go with them, and they got to deal with him. After that particular ride, I knew right then and there, I needed to be doing something where I knew how to handle myself, I knew I could deal with them, and I could put them in the proper place. So like a meth head like that that was wanting to fight a medic, I could scoop them up, take them to jail. That's where they belonged. I mean, because you were breaking the law. So I tossed it around a little bit after talking to Pete and Gila, which was Pete's wife. And, you know, after a while I thought, you know what, I'm going to try it. Because odds are you're not going to get in. Back then, getting in the highway patrol was just few and far between. And I had no law enforcement background. So I went ahead and went to paramedic school. I was going to go ahead and get to the next level, which obviously would mean more pay for me at the hospital. So I'd gone through school. I had just tested uh, for my paramedic license, and I missed one section. I think there's four sections, maybe been five. I missed one section by like two points. So I was gonna have to retest one section of that to get my license, which wasn't a big deal because I think it was static strips, which I mean, that is a big deal. You gotta know what you're doing with it, but many medics have to go through several of the sections more than once just because it is a very difficult class. It's a very difficult test. And so I had plans on taking the test again. Lo and behold, I get a letter in the mail saying, congratulations, you've been accepted into the 51st Academy of the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Now then, with your acceptance, we are going to put on a mini academy, which means a, it was a three day thing. I think it was either two or three days. And what they were wanting to put us through was a simulation of what academy life was like to see if that was something you could withstand because if you didn't want to be there they wanted to know then so they could offer your spot to somebody else so i go up and do this mini academy this mini mini academy was a nightmare oklahoma highway patrol academy is military based most of the guys are ex-drill sergeants and it was you know like two or three hours of sleep a night uh, I don't know how much we ran, push-ups, set-ups constantly, all sorts of drills right in the middle of the night while you're trying to sleep. And I mean, it was just rough and tumble. So I know there were many of the guys that quit on the spot. They didn't make it through the weekend. And I laugh because now I know all these guys now, but I was talking with one guy that I didn't know at the time. And I, in passing, we were talking, I said, you know, if they don't call me, I'm probably not going to be heartbroken because I can't imagine doing 18 weeks of this like this. So as it turned out, 
I made it through Mini Academy. They went ahead and selected me for the final stage of it. And so then I was truly in Academy. I said I was accepted the first one, but that was an acceptance contingent on completing the Mini Academy. And then they evaluated you again to see whether you wanted to continue on. So when I said I applied, it's not a simple process. Law enforcement today, I mean, you go into a local PD, they check a little bit of background, they see if you've been a law enforcement officer before, what kind of training you have, if they're going to have to put you through the training, and they hire you or don't. Highway Patrol was a background check on you where a trooper actually goes and talks to teachers, acquaintances, friends, family, and they find out everything they need to know about you. They check all your criminal records. They check... I mean, just anything you can think of, they are working on it, trying to figure it out. So I went through that process, I had to do an in-home interview with the trooper that was doing the background investigation. I then went on and you have to do, I believe it was a written test. You have to do a verbal interview where they ask you a bunch of questions and they want to see how you're going to react. And then on top of it, I had to go interview with a psychiatrist. Well, and that wasn't a normal thing in it at the time that you had to go see a psychiatrist, but what that came off of was one of the questionnaires they gave me. I remember the question. It said, I have witnessed and been involved in strange and unusual things. Well, I've been a medic for the last six years. Yeah, I've seen some very, very strange stuff, very odd things, and so I went in there and he asked me, the psychiatrist said, you know, you put this, this really makes us leery. And I said, well, I was a medic for six years. He just goes, oh, I said, yeah, I, I said, I'll give you some examples. One of them, I went with a medic to a house on a diabetic call. We walk in the house. A lady is there to meet us, to take us to this diabetic emergency. We walk five, maybe 10 paces into the house. I look to the left, look at the other medic. And I said, oh. There was a dead guy in the living room. He's laying on the couch and he's dead. The lady that's leading us in goes, oh, no big deal, he had a living wheel. He died about 30 minutes ago. Well, okay, it's a little odd. So we keep walking and what's funny, it felt like there was 400 doors between us and the back one that we were going to. I stopped at every room and I'm looking in to see what's in every room. Because normally people don't just have dead people laying on their couch. So we go back, and it was a true diabetic emergency. On the way out, I convinced the lady to let me put a cardiac monitor on this guy and check him out to make sure he was really dead. It's just, that's odd. So I explained that to this psychiatrist. He 100% agreed, and he just said, wow. And I'm sure I told him two or three other stories. But the thing that was weighing heavy on my mind, I mean, I was just waiting for this to come up. About, it was three weeks, maybe a month, before I'd gone to the mini academy. I'd already got the letter said I was going and I was needed to be there. I was on a transfer back from Oklahoma City to Ada. We had taken somebody up, dropped them off, and we knew there was bad weather coming in. And so we're on the way back and we get south of Shawnee, Oklahoma, and we start getting pages. Back then we had pagers and they were saying, you guys really need to pay attention to this weather. The tornado is here. If you're not to this point yet, stop. If you're past this point, speed up because it's coming at you. We were past that point. So I didn't speed up much because it was a downpour. I was doing about 60, 65 because I mean, those big old ambulances, they're not the most stable thing in the high wind. So we're going along and all of a sudden we're sideways in this ambulance right in the middle of the road and we start spinning off in the bar ditch, which by the way turned into a complete slow motion ride for me. It just all moves so slow. So we spin over into the bar ditch, hit it backwards, and I flip that thing up on its side. And so, and as while well, we're flipping it, I've actually still got the scar on my wrist. When we're flipping, I throw my arm up, I hit the window and shatter the window with my hand, and my hand goes through, hits grass as we're rolling. And I yank it back in, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've lost fingers. And guess who, of course, shows up to work that wreck? The Highway Patrol. So now I'm freaking out. And I told the guy, I said, look, I'm trying to get into the highway patrol. I've already, I made it this far and this is how far I am in the process. How is this gonna affect me? Well, I mean, he couldn't give me a definitive answer because who knows? They may look at that and say, oh, you can't handle emergency vehicles. 
And this was just a one-time incident for me, but you really don't know what they're basing all their decisions on, on whether to truly hire you or not. So I was kind of living on pins and needles at that point because I'm going through this whole process of getting into the academy and now they haven't asked me about it, so I haven't told them. Now it did come up later and when I mentioned it and I told them the situation. So it turns out I get contacted by that trooper later and they're wanting to know if we want to sue the road company that was working on this road because they were putting down a black felt. And they put felt, this felt stuff, underneath asphalt. And the reason they want to know if we were wanting to sue is because at no given time were they ever supposed to put something like, I don't know, half a mile of it or a quarter mile of it down at a time. It was some weird number. And they had like seven miles of it or five miles of it in a row. They put a lot of it down, which I get that because they're wanting to hustle through. The problem with this felt substance, when it rains heavy, it holds water and it's just like a big bubble. I mean, it just holds water underneath it and won't let it go anywhere. And so when you hit it, it's like ice. So this trooper had contacted me, letting me know that, hey, okay, here's the deal. We've got a working lawsuit on this, and we've got this many, I mean, it was like eight or ten people that were suing this company because they all had crashes through this area. And wanted to know if I wanted to jump in the lawsuit because I would be able to speak volumes for it being in the emergency field. Well, you know, I was back and forth. I'm not somebody that's real sue happy. And I certainly wasn't going to be involved in a lawsuit trying to get into highway patrol school. I just think that would have looked bad, so I just said no and moved on. So I made it through that process. I got through. The wreck ended up not being a big deal, and I got through the psychiatrist. It wasn't a big deal. I made it into academy. So I show up, and our academy used to be. I don't know if it is now. I haven't been back up there and worked at one or anything. I just... Wasn't my thing. I didn't want to be up there training those guys. They made us stay for five straight weeks before we could go home. So my trick to that was I had my parents drive me up there and drop me off, and I left my vehicle at my parents' house. Now, granted, I still lived in Ada, but I just let them drop me off. That way, I had no way of leaving, and so that way I couldn't quit. It was just a little mind game for me because many of the guys did drive up and we went in with 82 or 89 cadets when we started and I think we graduated 62. The attrition rate's unbelievable because we got out there and I mean, I'm talking about the physical fitness stuff. You're up at five in the morning, you're running at least one and a half miles at times three and four and there was actually one time that we had a state representative with us that wanted to come out and run. And this guy's actually a runner. So we take off running. And the tech officers were wanting to impress this guy. One of them took a wrong turn. We ended up running 13 miles. Either 11 or 13. I don't know. It was a lot. And we were all about to die. I mean, good Lord, we were run, used to running this two and three mile stuff. And now we're running 11, 13 miles. So the beauty of that was, was the guy took the wrong turn, didn't want to look like a fool, make a U-turn in the road, so we just took a really long trip. So the state representative, of course, was impressed with how in shape we were. We got back, they informed us that we wouldn't be doing much physical activity for the rest of the week. We were going to be doing mostly learning in the classroom because they were pumped because none of us fell out of the run. Now then, I said we had lots of physical training. I'm talking... You're up at 5, 30, 6 in the morning. You're out on the tarmac, out on the parking lot, and you're doing calisthenics. You're doing sit-ups, push-ups, jumping jacks, tons of that stuff. And then it's time to run. Oh, it's miserable. Well, if you screwed up, these guys were screaming at you like drill instructors. Or if you were lagging too far behind, they were screaming at you like drill instructors. So one of the days that had one of the biggest impacts on me was we had four Marines in the academy, I think. Two of them quit on the same day. They said, we didn't have to do this in Marine Corps. We're out. Well, yeah, I had never done any military stuff at all. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if a Marine's not making it through it, what am I thinking? But, you know, I pushed through, got through it, realized this was more of a, just a game for them than it was anything else. They were just wanting us to be in peak physical condition. 
whenever we went into fight week so we wouldn't hurt each other, so we'd all be at the same level and we could fight. So we went on through it. You know, you do just about a bunch and bunch of classroom, tons of driving training. Uh, there's just a ton of stuff there. And then we went to fight week, which for like, I don't know, two weeks, you learn jinjitsu. And so that's where we learned our, our fighting style. So anyway, went through academy, got stationed in a little place called Sulphur, Oklahoma, which is the second smallest county in the state. And I broke in with two guys from a county adjacent to us. Went through the learning process of that, how things actually work on the road, what I needed to do out here. And I mean, honestly, I couldn't have asked for two better mentors because they, these guys were seasoned. They both had five or six years on at the time and were both very upstanding guys. I mean, top notch. So I went and learned all that, got off break in and thus started my career. Uh, a couple of things I haven't ever really mentioned. Around year eight of my career, I got approached by a guy, and I forgot to tell you this earlier, while I was in college, I was 21, I don't know wild hair, I've always wanted to fly. I went and took flying lessons, and was right at, had over the hours to get my license, and I never went and took the test. Somehow, some guy finds out that I've done this and I've got all this instruction already. He asked me if I want to fly for the patrol. Well, I said, well, absolutely. So I got with him, we went and did a little bit of training, got me back up to speed, didn't take long, and he taught me the highway patrol way of flying, the way we flew different patterns, how we work traffic, how you look for bodies, looking for drug fields, stuff like that. And so I went ahead and took the test, passed the test, and went into Troop O, which is our flying unit. So I did that for two years until we had a budget crunch. And when that budget crunch hit, it was literally, I got a phone call one day that said, hey, uh, sorry to tell you this, effective tomorrow, you're back on the road. We're losing most of the guys. And to this day, it still isn't covered. They got it back up a little bit and had four or five guys. And now I think they have one airplane, one helicopter, just because of the way the budget was which I think is a terrible loss to the patrol, but you know, they don't ask me these questions. So that was the only other division of the patrol I've ever been in. And then I went back to the road and for my last 10 years, I was on the road. I was just a regular working trooper. Never tried to promote. I've uh, been asked several times why I never tried to promote because many of my classmates have. In fact, one of my classmates now the chief of the highway patrol, but I've never, I just simply tell them I never wanted to be in charge of a bunch of people. I've never had that power hunger. And and probably the biggest reasons, I want to worry about number one. I don't want to have to worry about everybody else and how their activity is doing, if they're stopping a bunch of cars, if they're working all the wrecks right. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the teacher that has to sit there and grade the wrecks and make sure they're done correctly before they get turned in. So I just never even tested to be a supervisor. Never was one of my interests. So like I said, I, I got out of that, got put back the road year 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. So at that time I thought, all right, this, this place is, it just, it was irritating to me because I loved flying. I, I wanted to do that the rest of my career. So then I was irritated. And so I started looking around. That's when I decided I was going to build a side hustle. So I got my dad involved and he and I built a hundred unit storage facility for RVs and boats. We live like right on Arbuckle Lake, not far from it. And I built this storage facility about two miles from it. That was my plan. Is that I thought, you know what, I'll get this going, I'll get out at 20 and I'll sell it. And I'll come out all right. I can move on and do whatever I want. So as it turns out, you know, we had some recessions in there. The storage worked decent. Uh, I got to year 20 or 19, mentioned to my wife, you know, hey, I'm thinking about retiring at 20 years. She said, no, you are. You're done. I hate your job. Don't want any part of it. So right there was my answer. I said, okay. So I went through the whole procedure, did all the paperwork, told them what I was up to. And December 15th of 2018, I went on vacation for four months. I burnt every bit of my vacation. And that went right up to 
March 28th, which was my anniversary date for the patrol, which ironically is my wedding anniversary, <laughs> but it went through the March 28th. I went up, I think I went up the 29th, the day after it, filled out all my paperwork, signed everything I needed to sign, and I was out. That was my career. I mean, obviously I've got stories in there, different stories to the patrol, which I'm going to tell over time, but that is basically just a summation of where I've ended up here. So the other part, the YouTube side, I worked with this guy for all 14 of his years, uh, or most of it. I guess I didn't work the last year. I said all, maybe all 13 of his years at the time. I worked with him. His name's Daniel Arms. He has a little old YouTube channel called Arms Family Homestead, and it right now I think is around 350,000 subscribers. So he got me interested because I thought, you know, dude, you're making some money. And at the time, he had about 30,000, 40,000. And he was making just a little money, nothing just extravagant. He was making, you know, $1,000 a month off this deal. And so I started looking into it. And I knew my wife and I, my wife doing screen printing, embroidery, shirts, etc. She was wanting to change the course of her business. She was wanting to shut down her storefront and start doing tra trade shows. So me being the computer nerd from college, I was looking at building a 3D printer. I had found the one I was going to order. She brings this up, and I thought, you know, I'll build a CNC machine. Basically the same process. It's an XYZ axis, and it works underneath it. So I started researching. So I researched and researched, looked up everything I could, started building. So in the end, I built a 4 foot by 4 foot CNC machine. Uh, the reason that I really felt like I could handle this is because of the computer training, I, the computer background. I could go in there and do all the wiring and wire it up to a computer and make it work. As it turns out, I wasn't wrong. I worked and worked on that thing. I don't know that I'd go back through it right now because it was a long process. Put that thing together and started up a YouTube channel. And within just two short months, had it monetized. And... Away I went. So later down the road, I enjoyed it. I still enjoy it. I still do the woodwork. I just knew I needed an outlet to talk, to do other things, whatever else was going on in my life. And so thus, I started Smokey Uncuffed. And when it first started, it was actually just, I'd drive around, show you the area, take you on vacation with me, uh, just talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. Well... You know, it didn't ever get much traction you know, like everything about everybody else. If it doesn't get a lot of traction, you get discouraged. And I already had a working channel that was working well, so I just went ahead and slacked off of it for about six, eight months. And then I thought, you know, I want to start a podcast. So I started really researching it, started a podcast. I thought, you know what? I've got a channel just sitting here that I could be throwing it on. So that's where we are today. I throw that podcast on my YouTube, too. And so now I've got those two things and the smoky CNC. So guys, that's me in a nutshell right now. If y'all haven't done so yet, please go over and check out Smoky CNC Woodworks. And if you hadn't checked out my www.smokyuncuffed.com, go check that thing out. It's got all sorts of links. My Smoky CNC Woodwork t-shirts I'm always wearing. And it's got all the podcasts on. So guys, that's it. If y'all haven't done so yet, please subscribe, and I'll see y'all and hear y'all next time.